My name is Michael Kamis. Who here knows who I am? Does anyone here know who I am? I do. Thanks, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do two things. Uh, during the day, uh, I have a mild-mannered job as director of technology for Key Code Media. And at night, they let me wear a cape and do a web series called Five Things. Has anyone here heard of Five Things? Mom again, thank you. OK, so what Five Things is is a web series where I cover a lot of the hot topics in the industry, but I get away from the marketing-ish. Right? Uh, anytime you go to a manufacturer's web page and you look at you know, specs and speeds and feeds, you know, it's all best case. right? And that's all what the manufacturer says it can do, not what real world is. And so what I try to do is, is dispel a lot of the stuff that you see out there that may not be real and explain concepts that not a lot of people know, beginners may not know. We're at NAB, so I'm sure all of you know all this, so I expect some people to be nodding off. But there are folks who don't understand some of these concepts. Things like HDR, things like LTO, asset management, transcoding in post. Tells me that gets all the women. Women love transcoding. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, but one of the most popular ones I did is something called post myths. You know, anyone here that spends any amount of time on help forums or on Facebook groups there's always questions out there that you just shake your head and you do a face palm and like, wow, people really think that. And it's not the questions. It's people answering those questions with the most asinine answers, right? So you almost have to you know, correct the correctors. And so what I did with this episode was take some, some popular myths that I've seen in post-production and try and distill them down to the basics. And so I thought I'd go through uh, a few of those with you today. Sound good? Yeah? yeah? yeah. Okay. The first one is transcoding to a better codec will improve quality, right? How many people have shot on a GoPro and someone says, just make it into a ProRes, it'll look better. <laughs> OK, we'll cover that. Uh, log formats are the same as HDR, right? Uh, next is you can grade video on a computer monitor. Uh, I've actually seen fights break out when I've uh, presented this before between computer and video people. It's pretty interesting, nerd fight. You can fix audio distortion. As an audio guy, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, storage is the same as capacity, or marketing versus engineering. Uh, and then if we have time, I have two more to go over, and that's that uh, you need to create a YouTube format if you want to upload to YouTube. And the last one is picture or audio changes require a new export. Like if you mess something up in your timeline, you have to re-export the entire thing. That's not exactly the case. So let's get started. First. I asked this question on Facebook, and Andrew Webb said, yes, changing 8-bit to 16-bit will give you more color. Also, changing 420 to 444 will give you more color. And also, dropping the project hard drive will make the pixels blurry, but I'm not going to cover that one. <laughs> so the things that we're answering in this myth is, uh, well, we want to improve visual quality, right? Why would we transcode? Well, we want to improve it. Um, it's easier for the computer to use, right? You've all heard that working with compressed media like 264 or long GOP footage doesn't play well with CPUs, and we need something that isn't long GOP or compressed. And also, I read on a forum that I should use it. That's popular on Creative Cow. So, and this gets into some really nerdy stuff, stuff that, you know, when you want to clear a room at night, you bring up this stuff, uh, bit depth, chroma subsampling or chroma sampling, transcoding and dithering. These are words that don't come up in typical conversation, except here at NAB, of course. I'm, hopefully, everyone here understands the difference between 10-bit and 8-bit, right? A majority of the cameras out there are shooting 8-bit, right? Some of the higher ones are shooting 10-bit or better. But if you actually compare them, 8-bit only has 256 colors, right? The RGB sampling. If you do 10-bit, that's 1,024 colors. You can kind of see the banding through here, right? That's 75% more info. So it would make sense in some warp logic to say, well, if I gave something 75% more quality, it would look better, right? Well, that's when we get into sampling, right? I'm not going to bore you with a dissertation on uh, chroma subsampling, but this is how what 411, 420, 422, and 444 means. It's basically sampling an area of four pixels and sampling the amount of pixels within that pixel to come up with a round number. Not going to bore you with it. Here's a better way of phrasing it. This is the 2000 Democratic presidential primary. Notice I didn't do last year because that's still a hot topic. I'm not going to touch that. But I could sit here all day and read you the results from each polling place, right? That's boring as hell. Wouldn't it be a lot easier just to say that, right? And that's basically what chroma subsampling is. It's saying, you know what? I don't have to give you all this information. I just have to give you this, all right? Here's another way of looking at it. 
let's say you pour yourself a drink when you get home, right? Whatever that drink is, it's completely up to you. But there's your glass, right? But you say, you know what? I want more. I want a bigger glass, okay? You're not adding anything to that. All you're doing is putting the same amount of info in a bigger bucket. So what that means is you're eating up more storage space, you're eating up computational time, and you're not getting any more quality. So why is it mostly false? And I'm surprised Gary or someone here isn't waiting to go, but, but, but. How many here are familiar with dithering? Few people? OK. Let's say you shoot 420 4K UHD, but your deliverable is HD. You can dither down from 420 uh, 4K down to HD 422. Because remember, when you, when you do chroma subsampling, you're pulling the average between those pixels. right? So you can actually increase your color space by decreasing your, your uh, raster size. Right? So that's the only time you can really add more information to it. So you can certainly give us a shot. You can see this. Actually, I think I have a bigger picture here. You can see here on the right-hand side, that's a lot smoother than the other ones. And that's dithered from UHD 420 to full HD 444. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? OK, cool. All right, let's move to the next one. Jason Bodosh, friend of mine, shooting log does not give you more dynamic range. And I kind of alter that to log formats are the same as HDR, because HDR is a hot buzzword. I want to shoot HDR. OK. So this deals with a couple different points regarding color in video. Uh, we deal with dynamic range. So that would be SDR, standard dynamic range, or HDR, high dynamic range. We're also dealing with various log formats, right? Every camera manufacturer has their own log, right? Because they're artists. Also, I read on a forum that I should use it, right? How many people have said, well, this, they recommended on the forum that I should shoot log, and then they have no idea how to use it, right? <laughs> That's when you get some funky resolve LUTs right there, yeah. So here's a good way of thinking about it. When you shoot traditional video cameras, SDR, you get eight to 10 stops of dynamic range, right? Like when you walk into, let's say, your bedroom at night and the lights are on, you turn the lights off, the room's dark, but after a while, you can kind of see, right? Because your eyesight's adjusting to those eight to 10 stops within that, that visual range, right? So what we want to do with high dynamic range is to actually get more in that space, right? Here's another way of looking at it. This is a beautiful picture of a sunset, right? When you use a camera with standard dynamic range, you get that, right? It gets blown out. Do you see that? What we want to do is recapture that so we get all of this. That's where high dynamic range comes into play. Now, if we take a look at HDR on scopes, an SDR versus HDR, you can see that the log image on the scopes does not expand uh, over the full uh, brightness range. Right? So log is not giving you that HDR, which I know there are different standards with HDR, but it's traditionally over 1,000 nits. That's not hitting over 1,000 nits on the scope. So it's mostly false. The exception is that log will not give you HDR, but you can shoot log in HDR when, uh, when all your gear is HDR. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. Moving on. Maybe why color grading on a computer monitor is different than color grading on a video monitor. This is big for independent uh, editors who don't want to buy a video monitor, right? Perhaps uh, in LA, we have a lot of assistant editors who may be cutting out of their house, and they're doing stuff that's going to broadcast. Well, uh, how can you check the colors, right? Especially, especially if you're doing grading. Um, and the answer I hear all the time is, well, it's close enough. OK, well, how about next time we're in the edit bay and your director wants to change a frame, you know, they're frame effing, right? And you say, no, no, it's close enough. That doesn't fly. No, they're going to be messing with that frame all day long. So the same, can be, same is for color, right? If we're going to all that trouble and all that budget, why would you want to view something on something that's substandard, right? So this deals with several things. It deals with gamma curves. Again, boring. Uh, it also deals with computer emulation and monitor emulation, which I'll get into in a second, and also various display technologies. So the traditional color space of a computer, and I say traditional because there's all sorts of things out there, is sRGB. For, for HD video, it's Rec. 709, right? And you can see as you look here, they're, they're pretty close, right? When you zoom in closer, though, you can see that there is a difference. It's slight, but it's different, right? And for those of you who really like charts, I've got this, which shows all the color spaces mapped into one. And they're all close, right? For the most part, they're all close. But as I said earlier, close isn't good enough, you know? Not only do we have to deal with the different color spaces, fundamental differences, but we also have to deal 
with the computer that's talking to that computer monitor, right? How many of you have seen the window on the left on your Mac, right? The computer wants to manage the color that's being output. So now you're dealing with not only the color management that the monitor has, but also the color management that the computer wants, right? Windows has the same thing, right? On the right-hand side, that's Windows 10. You also are dealing with different monitors. Right? We have aging plasmas, and believe it or not, people in LA still have a ton of plasmas. Uh, we have LCD, we have the TFT and IPS. Uh, did anyone see the new IPS panels this year? No? Okay, well, uh, LCD, you're familiar with LCD, right? There's always backlight, even if you're showing black through there, you still have backlight. They now have a new panel that puts an extra layer in between there that when black is shining through the pixel, uh, or uh, through, the, uh, through the LCD, it actually puts a blinder in front of it. So you're getting true black. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So now LCDs are going to cost more than OLEDs. Go figure. <laughs> uh, we also have OLED. You know, black is the new black. I think it's the coolest tagline I've ever heard. And projection. And if you really want to get into acronyms, there you go. LCD is liquid crystal display with thin film transistor and in-plane switching and organic light emitting diodes. I will be giving a test at the end. <laughs> That's false. That's false. Uh, mainly because, as I just said, they're different. The color spaces are different, and if you do a grade on a computer monitor for video, it will look different on a video monitor, which means it may get bounced back from QC. No one wants to get bounced back from QC. So next up, we have my favorite one, because actually before I decided to get into the zeros and ones, I was a creative, I was a post-audio guy, and this is a popular one. I, can, I come from Chicago, and a lot of films were shot near the L-Tracks. If you've ever spent any time near the L-Tracks, they're loud. And invariably, the director will call action right when an L is passing by, so the dialogue gets all destroyed, right? So when we talk about audio, Adam Bedford brought this up. Audio modulation, you can't fix distortion. I think he meant audio over modulation, but we won't split hairs. This deals with several things. Repair tools, like you'll find in your NLE or plugins. It deals with the black art of post-audio. I still like to think that that's kind of a black art to some people. And also, I can't afford reshoots or ADR or I just don't want to deal with the stress of reshoots or ADR. So I'm going to go back to this analogy again. Just like with video, with audio, this is the audible spectrum. But quite often, you're using microphones that can only capture this much, right? So the signal gets blown out. Here's a good example. There's where you hear it in the wild. But when you capture it with a poor microphone, you're only getting this much. Right? So everything above and below in terms of amplitude is lost. You can't recover that. So what traditionally happens is that repair tools guess what should be there. They see what's going up and what's coming down, and they say, well, given you know, the, uh, the trajectory and how long it's been doing this, we're guessing it's going to be at this point. That could be completely wrong. You often lose body or warmth. It becomes what they call crunchy. Right? And uh, this goes back to one of my favorite sayings. It's, there's never enough money to do it right, but there's always enough money to do it again. So if the dialogue doesn't come out right, well, I guess we are going to have to do ADR after all. So audio overmodulation, you can't repair, but you can try to put a Band-Aid on it. And usually that means putting the music a little higher, putting the background effects up a little bit more, doing stuff to kind of hide it. So that's false. This is my favorite one. It's also the most boring one, because I think I'm the only one in the world that gets up excited about spindles and codecs. Right? So spindles. Uh, storage is the same as capacity. This deals with RAID requirements. Again, no one really likes talking about RAID, although I think some LumaForge people here may disagree with me on that one. Uh, marketing versus actual, uh, which actually is a base 2 versus base 8 math. I swore I would never use a phrase like that in my life, but here I am talking about base levels of math, and then OS requirements. OK, everyone here knows what a RAID is, right? Yeah. Right? OK. But I think what I may do is skip over a little portion of this in the interest of time. But a uh, RAID, obviously, is redundancy. It gives you uh, faster speed, usually. It gives you more protection in case a drive goes south. Uh, it also increases what they call the MTBF, which is the mean time between failure. This means that the chances of a drive failing are a lot sooner when you have multiple drives compared to one drive. Um, we also deal with software RAIDs versus hardware RAIDs. I have the 60% rule in storage, right? And, and uh, Patrick, you can certainly use this at LumaForge, but I expect royalties. Uh, the patent is pending. So how I learn to embrace marketing, math, and performance. OK, so you go to the store. And I know drives are a little bit bigger than one terabyte now, but 
indulge my math here. Let's say you buy a one terabyte drive. You never get one terabyte off the bat. Why is that? Well, that's because we're dealing with base 8 math versus base 2 math. We're dealing with kilobytes, megabytes, and megabits, which are multiples of 8, as opposed to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. When you add all that up, you get a 7% loss off the bat. Once you pop that drive in your machine, most drives that adhere to this marketing versus engineering spec, you'll get 930 gigabytes. Now we have RAIDs. And I know uh, people are going to call me out on this. RAIDs, as I mentioned, give you redundancy. Depending on what RAID you go with, you lose different amounts of storage to that protection. Right? If it's four drives, you're going to lose one drive. But if it's 100 drives, you're not going to lose as much storage. So what I did is I looked at all the different storages units that I dealt with and how much am I traditionally losing with RAID 5. Comes out to about 15%. OK? No one's going to arm wrestle me on that. We're good. No? OK, cool. So we take 7% from that uh, one terabyte. We then take another 15% from that terabyte. Next, we have best performance buffer. Right? How many of you have always been told never fill your drives up? Right? Especially spinning drives. Because performance isn't linear. Right? Performance does that. Right? We're in the age of um, uh, solid state now, where this is less of an issue. But still, most storage arrays are based on spinning disk because you get more capacity. Right? So once you add all these up, this is what it looks like. 7% lost, another 15, another 20, 632 gigs of usable space. And those of you who are thinking the math is off, trust me, I'm taking 15% from that 930, and I'm taking that 20% from that, uh, I think, 790 gig mark. So that means you're getting only about 40% maybe a little bit more, of the storage that you think you're buying. So next time you're talking to a client or you're looking for uh, storage yourself, and you say, well, I think I'll probably shoot, I don't know, maybe a terabyte of storage. Probably should be getting two drives, not one. <laughs> OK, this is my favorite one because it's just a, a duh moment. Uh, you know, a few minutes ago, I talked about 8-bit versus 10-bit and how compressed, et cetera. Well, when you compress a file and then recompress it and recompress it, it's kind of like the old days of tape. Right, where you make a dupe, you make a dupe, you make a dupe, and suddenly you, it's, it's fuzzy. You can't tell what it is. Same thing happens with YouTube. If you cut something in DNX, ProRes, Cineform, or maybe you already have an H.264 from your GoPro, and then you transcode that to a YouTube preset inside uh, Adobe Media Encoder or Compressor, right? then you upload it. You know that YouTube is compressing that again, right? Everyone knows that? They're also putting a compressor on your audio. Why help them out? If they're already going to compress your stuff down, why? Why, why not just give them a high-res file? If you go to their recommended spec se uh, page settings, they have a page here which recommends your bit rates. Now, when I first came up with this uh, uh, presentation, Google used to have a document that said, for enterprise accounts, you can upload ProRes, et cetera, et cetera. That document is now gone. What you can actually do is upload ProRes. So what I do with five things is I do my edit, I export a mezzanine file, a ProRes 422HQ, and then I upload it. Yes, I need to leave for a couple hours when I upload it, but I upload that and YouTube will flip it. YouTube will create their file out of that. I can also do Cineform. I can also do DNX. Now, right now I'm doing DNX HD. At last check, they don't, they don't handle DNX HR yet, but it's going to take a while. And here's the math. If, as I mentioned, I do a ProRes 422HQ at 1080p. That's about 1.5 gigabytes a minute, right, in terms of how big the file is. Uh, my upload speed at home is 1.5 megabytes a second. So that's about 16 minutes per gigabyte. That means for a 10-minute episode of five things, it takes 2.6 hours. So if you have an average home connection um, and you want to do this, it's fine. It's just going to take a while. But you will see a quality difference, especially in the banding uh, among gradients. So it's false. The last one is more based around a cool tool uh, that I've uh, worked with. Um, let's say you, created, you finish an hour-long program. And you, uh, like me, have fat fingers, and you fat finger a lower third. You type someone's name wrong, right? What does that usually mean? Usually means, oh, man, i got to now babysit a new export, right? you got to export the entire thing. That's not the case. For years, we've been able to use QuickTime Pro, right? and just swap out audio tracks and rewrap it right, without retranscoding. It's a cool little hack. But as we know, QuickTime is going the way of the dodo, is uh, being phased out. So there are other ways we can do that. And that's why there's a tool called CineX Insert. No, they are not paying me for this. 
Uh, they have a free version that just got announced. And for those of you, how many here have worked with tape? OK, we do, have, we do have some folks here. OK, so whenever you wanted to do a punch in on tape, right? all you had to do was set your in point, your out point, you did punch in, insert editing. You can do the same thing with digital files now. With CineX insert, you can punch in to DNX, ProRes, almost any file out there and just replace that section. So you can not only fix mistakes, but what a lot of folks in LA are doing is they'll pre-black an hour-long show and then just punch in every time a segment is done. So that means at the end, they don't have to do a complete output. They're only outputting that one section when it's done. And I put an asterisk next to, next to the price down there because they just released a free version that handles a few formats. I think it handles ProRes, uh, VBR, and CBR, I think, and a couple other formats. So I think it plugs into both Avid and Premiere. So you could download that and check that out. And here's just the interface. Uh, but you have your file you want to uh, cut into, insert into on the right, and the new section on the left, and you just punch in. Dead simple. And those are post myths. Uh, my name is Michael Thomas, and please check out the website, view, like, and share often. Thank you.